It's Friday, April the 13th, 2018, and you're listening to Amusing Ourselves to Death. Hi, Cam. Hi, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. And what are we going through today? Uh, well, there's a couple of things that we should probably mention first that we got right last week. What uh, are they? We, you, some people might have read Owen Jones's recent article, which was to do with Andrew Neil and his position on impartiality and how that a figure like him is able to exist inside the BBC when it has such strict rules, which is something we talked about last week. Okay, and so what is it, what's so weird about Andrew Neil? I know we talked about it before, <laughs> but what's, what's the issue? Well, Owen Jones's line was not necessarily a specific um, attack on Andrew Neil himself, but to suggest that someone like him existing in the BBC would not be possible on the left. And so when you say someone like him, you're talking about the fact that he's the chairman of the company that owns The Spectator mm -hmm. and The Telegraph very super right-wing Brexit yeah. newspapers. He's also expressed some, you know, very uh, right-wing views before, been quite open about those sorts of things in the past. And someone with that kind of viewpoint, as hard right as he has been, would never be allowed to be a kind of big figure on the BBC from the left left-wing point of view. Okay. Um, who would the left-wing person be that <laughs> could even feel those, you know, be as compromised as that? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that we would it have would be us, wouldn't it? <laughs> Probably. It would be, it'd be <laughs> us, Aaron. They need um, more of us on the BBC. Artist taxi driver. Yeah. It'd be, um, yeah. Okay. Um, fine. That's good. Um, what else did you get right or we get right? Or? Well, we talked a little bit about, obviously, the China and USA tech war that was going on, what was going on behind the trade war that's been very visible re recently. And obviously this week we've had the hearings of Mark Zuckerberg. And he's had two days of hearings, and I've listened to, to most of it, unfortunately. Facebook is not a monopoly, apparently. Um, but he... Wait, sorry, please <laughs> un un unpack. So I've decided there's we've got new rules because we gabble, we talk quickly, and it's hard to keep up. So... Mm. Uh, we've got unpack and debunk. Okay. Uh, debunk is hopefully what we're doing all the time, but we might get boring by just veering off topic. And unpack means come back and say what you mean. So mm -hmm. unpack, please. You just said apparently Facebook is not a monopoly. I assume this is your sarcasm. <laughs> you, you'd be right there. So Mark Zuckerberg was appearing before um, a bunch of US senators who only get about four minutes each, I think is the limit, which kind of stage managers how much they're able to ask him anyway but okay. at one point they they asked him some useful questions some not useful questions but they said at one point do you think that facebook is a monopoly and he says it certainly doesn't feel like that to me and this is after he said repeatedly a hundred billion times people come and use our services uh two and two billion people obviously are, are users on facebook and then when the senator asked well if i was upset with facebook and i say i want to leave facebook what is the other service that offers me the same as you? Where is the competitor? Because comp competition is a kind of way of regulating monopolies. Mm. Uh, but then at the same time, Mark Zuckerberg is denying that Facebook is a monopoly, which is the central theme, I think, that is the problem. I mean, when we spoke to Bev Skeggs, who's a okay, sociologist... Okay, so, so, so interesting that that was teased out. So he said, uh, I don't think I'm a monopoly, despite having said we serve the world for free. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And then you were saying something about Bev Skeggs. So we saw Bev Skeggs when we interviewed her, and then you saw her on Tuesday. Oh, yeah. we, we did. Yeah. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, should we... Okay, then tell me, what did Bevsko say? The central point was that how to deal with Facebook. She said we need to break down these monopolies because it gives them such a degree of power that, I mean, her one of her points was that they have a different approach to legality, so it means that they can, they're so big that they're going around going, take us on, and Google and Facebook have all these legal cases, but then they're also lobbying in places like Illinois where they have the Biometric Information Privacy Act, which is like, they just happen to have this act that had come around from another uh, era that now Facebook, what it's doing is illegal, and so they've put in lawmakers and lobbyists to water down that law so that they can carry on doing what they're doing. So when people have that much power, Bev Skeg said we need to break them down first. So Okay, so just, just to say your example of the biometric thing, so is what you're saying that Facebook and whoever else, they've got the money to be able to buy up the patents exactly. and then afterwards to uh, pay off the politicians to be able to get something passed into law. And it's only because they've got so much money they're able to do that and so they just get bigger and bigger. That's it, yeah. And so breaking down that monopoly power is central to this. But in Mark Zuckerberg's... And, you know, obviously we're in a moment now where the heat is on Facebook. Potentially we could see some changes, but will it break down the monopoly power? Now in Mark Zuckerberg's notes, which was... Um, shared around Twitter, there was one point where it says, break up FB, question mark, and he says, 
breaking down Facebook would allow dominance of Chinese companies. And as we talked about last week, this tech war is happening. And Facebook is now going to appeal to this American pride of these American giants and these American tech companies and continuing to allow them to do what they want because we don't want China taking that top spot. Yeah, interesting. And of course, last week we um, and so so first of all, that's interesting. Um, also, that's something that has been used before in the in the business press in America and over here. You know, mm. it's better to you think they're a monopoly, but it's better to have them instead of you know <laughs> you know for, for global competition. Do you want to be a country of winners or not? But interesting that Babylon are doing the deep learning in uh, China with the health contract that they've got with um, yeah Tencent. So, yeah, there is competition. Um, what else is going on? What else? Uh, so let's forget what we've got right. What else <laughs> did you do last week? So I had the event that we talked about at the London School of Economics with Bev Skeggs, Natalie Fenton and Chris Hughes, who's the one of the founders of Facebook. What was the event about and what was it for again? So it was called, it was after Chris Hughes has written his book called Fair Shot, Rethinking Inequality and How We Earn. And it was to do with his proposal for the idea of a guaranteed income now there's some different uh, names and they mean slightly different things so we should try and maybe unpack some of those things so the guaranteed income in his point of view is that the one percent should pay a guaranteed income to all and yeah to all working people and that includes students and that includes you know unpaid labor if you're uh, caring for someone oh okay interesting five hundred dollars a month was his kind of Okay, so it's not much, but at least he's widening the definition of work from the one that we have at the moment. This is true, but in the book, I mean, he said quite different things on stage. Uh, me and Natalie were talking about this. How, slightly Natalie different. Natalie Fenton. Yeah. So he said, um, I'm suggesting that we have a basic income for everybody. And that right wing, as I said, so you're suggesting give the $500 to everybody. And he's like, yes. But in the book, he seemed to draw a little bit of a clearer border around who gets it. Like it didn't seem very clear whether homeless people would get it. And that, mm. that to me would be absurd. Um, so maybe he's warming to the idea of it being universal. But he, but he, in the book, it didn't seem like he quite meant okay, that. Okay. So he was talking about what you called a guaranteed income. Mm -hmm. Um, That's his words. Yeah, um, and I was at the event as well. I thought it was. I thought you did very well. By the way, you made some very good points that I think you may have made here in the past. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what else do you take away from the event? Well, I think it's interesting. Well, I guess we're going to talk about the idea of universality, and we've, we're actually going to talk about the DWP and so on. So I think. Um, the difference between Chris Hughes is that he doesn't believe that you should, well, in his case, is that he's not giving you enough to live on. He's giving you enough to top up and to give you this economic security, which is the name of his project, the Economic Security Project. And, you know, the reasons that he gives are good and right and things I can see other people using. And it comes from the 1%, which I think is an important thing that the universal basic income would be from other places in government systems. Um, but... Is it enough to live on or is it not enough Not enough to live on? I think those are kind of distinctions between the universal basic income and his. And are there problems with it not being universal? Because are we just drawing a new border around who gets what? Okay. And someone asked a, an interesting question about whether it would then just be, you know, uh, preyed on by... Uh, other employers. forces who would say employers would say you've yeah. got this basic income so now or you've got this in guaranteed income so now we'll pay you less because you can survive because we yeah. know does it justify that. bad conditions already yeah okay well um but also that it could be preyed on again by by you know business types who say oh we need to we need to reduce that yeah if we if we don't make it universal okay what i remember from the event was that the first thing that uh, natalie said uh, was uh, thank you very much for opening up this debate and the last thing that Chris Hughes said was, by the way, whether you agree with my ideas or not, I feel strongly about mine, whether you agree with them or not, the thing to do is write an article about it, get involved. Mm -hmm. Because actually it doesn't matter what I think, what matters is that the debate starts. And he was talking about inequality really and injustice. So mm -hmm. it is good that that's happened. Um, he suggested like Alaska have oil. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, we can have a kind of dividend uh, every six months or every year people in alaska get fifteen hundred dollars per person it's 2.5 percent of the uh revenue profits. Is it? yeah right make. so he said something like that and then he said maybe we can do that with data uh which yeah is, which is hilarious 
Especially because at the, as the event privacy. was going on, Zuckerberg's hearing was due to start. It was a really interesting moment that it was happening that evening. Yeah, he said, we can sell your privacy. And you might be able to hear in the recording me going, oh. Um, <laughs> he didn't say sell your privacy. He said sell your data. Um, and that was interesting. And he was sort of talking about different ways in which society could function. What I found really interesting was towards the end, I couldn't see him, but a gentleman who sounded a bit older mm. from India, he said, we well, can't do any of this without reforming the intellectual property laws. Yes. And I remember completely agreeing with him, but not really being able to explain exactly why that was exactly the right thing to do. But I think it was... Um, <laughs> It was a shame that question came in in like the last tranche of questions and we had about a minute left and Chris just summed up really. Um, but that was an important question and Bev Skegg said it was important. Well, we mentioned last week that Facebook had been buying up all these patents uh, to do with biometric scanning and uh, facial recognition and so on. So it's in the background buying up all these things. And because these organisations are so big and as Bev Skegg said, people don't understand how they work and they don't know how to monitor or regulate them. That means that they're moving into these new spaces and are the first to start patenting all these things that other people will rely on. It's you know, as Guy Standing, he talks about rentier capitalism. I think I think you've I think you've property. nailed it because I was just wondering. I mean, I just asked you out loud, hmm, reforming IP, why? Um, and you've given me some very very good reasons there. Um, because... It's not. I mean, it's not just in the tech world. We've um, we've done a bit of work about Monsanto, and they've similarly been buying up seed patents and so on and some of them are kind of overlapping with things that people have just owned in common for a long time so they're owning almost nature so this um guy standing says that the we patenting life isn't it yeah yeah the intellectual property organization the world's intellectual property organization has like has gone up to three million patents when it was you know much lower just a few short years ago and so there's this craze by these big companies to own the royal receive royalties for people just doing things. Yeah, I remember once seeing Vandana Shiva many years ago saying, um, "You can't patent life. Um, you can't trade. First of all, it's not intellectual property, but secondly, you can't trade it because you can't own it and you can't exchange it like that." Yeah. And then the WTA set up this thing, this thing called TRIPS, trade related intellectual property, mm -hmm. and she said, "You can't trade it, but if you put a TR in front of it and call it trade related, you could probably get away with it," which they did. Um, wow. Quite clever. What else has been going on this week? Um, well, I noticed in the papers that BP are going to be having their AGM in Manchester, and that's going to be on the 21st of May. I thought, well, that's a quite short notice. There's fracking going on up there. BP frack in Oman. They frack in New Mexico, which is in the United States. They've not exactly got the best history in the United States with the deep water crisis, um, uh, horizon oil spill and all of that kind of mm. thing. So I just thought, well, it feels as though it's an opportunity to raise awareness at the BP AGM amongst people in Manchester of what BP are doing, what fracking is all about and that sort of thing. So hopefully Share Action, an organisation that encourages... What do they do? They encourage people to go to the big company's annual meetings and confront the uh, chairman or the CEO of the company, uh, ask some questions and get answers and occasionally get them to actually do something about their policies. So, What's it, as in they want them to invest in other things? Like what are they trying to get them to change? Well, I think on this occasion they would be saying what you're doing around the world is bad because there is this thing called the carbon bubble and essentially if... So a stock market company like BP or Shell, mm -hmm. if you take the valuation of Shell or BP, how much it's worth, if they were to extract at current oil prices all of the energy that they would need in order to justify their valuation yeah the earth would blow up <laughs> that's just the numbers so if you burn that much coal or oil or whatever it is that gives them their price mm. then um, the world would blow up and the pension funds know that Incredible. but they're still invested in them mm -hmm. and so that because it, these are the things that pension funds i guess are can rely on unfortunately are these industries that are oil and fracking and energy that are actually, in many cases, still addicted to things that are going to kill us. Yeah, the pension fund is supposed to help you in the future, and yet <laughs> it's there actually undermining the future. That's a good point. So it's a classic double bind, <laughs> but um, yeah, we can talk about that term another day. Um, so yeah, trying to get as many people as possible right now to know that there's this workshop that's going to be hopefully happening in Manchester in the first week of May, and that will 
kind of train people how to buy a share and how to confront a CEO, maybe a little bit of role play or something like that. Um, Why do you think they've moved to Manchester? Not sure. Is that to wrong foot people? I mean, it's not like they haven't been doing climate crime every year. <laughs> and, you know, people, I mean, I do know that in the paper, I read in the papers that sometimes people are not allowed in, even though they've got shares. Oh, really? Because they know them and they just go, no, no, no. But at the same time, there's a book that I found from 2011 about BP. And it starts off by talking about the kind of carnival atmosphere outside BP. I mean, outside the Royal Festival Hall in London when they have their AGM. And then afterwards, it's a, there's a bunch of regulars that go there for the AGM. Mm. I've only ever been to one AGM, uh, Barclays one. And um, yeah, apparently it's very similar people that go to lots of the similar AGMs. So right. yeah, so it's, it's a good opportunity. And um, I've been getting quite a lot of support from Matt from Dsmog, who told me he's going to contact people from 350.org, who mm. are a global organization that look into divestment and uh, people and planet. So hopefully some people will know about it and um, hopefully we'll find a way of connecting people up and covering it. Mm. I mean, Matt, we should probably mention some of the recent work that they've been doing. Oh, yeah, what's that? Specifically around Shell. Uh, what Shell Is it called What Shell New? I think it's just hashtag Shell New. Okay. So this is a constantly, I mean, an Exxon are in a similar position, I think, as well. This constantly unfolding story about to what degree these companies knew that their actions and their business was um, contributing to climate change and climate crisis and so on. Um, so they put together an excellent little video that flicks through, I think, the last since the early 90s, all the times when um, Shell would have known what was happening and all, the, all these times when... I'm not, I am not. can't remember the I think exact. it's 86 was the first date that I saw on one oh, of those really? documents. Okay. But, I mean, I, I haven't really looked at it properly. Yeah, yeah. I asked Matt, what should we say if we had to sum it up? And he mm. said something like, um, essentially, it just opens them up to a lot more litigation risk as well as reputational risk, because it shows that they are, yeah, they can be sued for mm. knowingly having misled everybody. And the more they do that, the more their business model falls. Uh, moving on from that issue, mm. um, I did notice also that it's the Euribor trial, which is about interest rate rigging that's going on at Southwark Crown Court. And so these are Barclays executives or Barclays traders that are being done for that. Mm -hmm. And um, that whole aspect of where banks rig interest rates and then afterwards, years later, after collecting all of these bonuses, then when they get done, which is rare, if they get done, then... Um, these fines that can be really high, the shareholders don't like the fact that the company is being fined. But at the same time, you can see that the bank thinks of it as the cost of doing business. Right. Yeah. And so I think that's what Matt's argument is. Um, he's saying, how many fines do they want? But at the same time, maybe what we didn't go into in the short time that we interacted was to what degree will they say it's the cost of doing business? I mean, are oil companies going to get to the point where they're having to pay out as many fines as the banks? And right, the, yeah. the banks obviously still, it all outweighs each other. You know, the yeah. profits are still greater than the than the fines. Yeah. But is there going to be a stage where, you know, like with tobacco or something like that? Who knows? But that's part of the story. Interesting. I think then in New York, there was that recent story that um, they were going to take some of these energy companies to court over their contribution to the climate crisis. So it seems like there is a moment where that's turning and the idea of litigation is becoming closer. Yeah, and the, the whole concept of class action. Um, our friend Emma Friedman, she is someone who has been campaigning to reform the laws on valproate, which is a, a drug for people with epilepsy that was created by the company Sanofi in France, mm. French company. Um, and obviously we're going to cover this at some yeah, point yeah. in the future properly. But um, in France, they did a class action to um, get justice. And over here, well, I mean, when was the last time you heard about a class action in this country that actually functioned? I mean, our legal system um, functions very well for certain entities. I yeah. believe it's mainly corporations. And yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to looking into that. You interviewed Selma James this week, didn't you? Yep, I certainly did. So we went down to the Crossroads Women's Centre, which which has been around since 1975. I think it's been around for a shorter time in Kentish Town, but they've been doing this work for a while. And Selma James is a, a kind of big figure who's been talking about race and sex and class for a while. She's written some a couple of really great books 
and uh, literature. She's American, long-time kind of anti-racist campaigner. And we went down to talk to her about the idea of the basic income because obviously we've been talking to Bev Skeggs and Chris Hughes. But Selma has been talking about the idea of unwaged labour for a very long time. I remember actually towards the end of Chris Hughes' talk on Tuesday at the LSC, Bev Skeggs said, oh, uh, Selma James's wages for housework campaign from 1972... <laughs> And that really kind of completed the circle for me because we met up with Selma the day after, didn't we? We did, we did. Yeah, it was very interesting timing. Yeah, so we've got that interview coming out soon. Um, and also to get her insights in terms of the progress that's been made over the last few years, where we're falling down, the f feeling of the current moment, and some of the work they've been doing, uh, which is really, really important. They work with all sorts of women in compromised situations, such as uh, one of their campaigns has been to do with uh, working class women who are having their children taken away by the state and she said it's you know almost exclusively happening to to working class women so they've been doing a pitch a picket every wednesday they've been doing that for quite a while now the family and I'm, court yeah, in yeah. holborn i'm sure we'll go into again that subject as well but really interesting interview that'll be up soon i had a look at the flyer actually that um, because when we interviewed uh, Selma, when you interviewed Selma, um, they'd just come back from the picket and they showed me the flyer. And on the back of the flyer, there were about five or six lines or maybe eight lines. Each one was a sort of demand. And each one of those lines was like a whole documentary for us. Mm. You know, one was on legal stuff. One was on, well, just so many other things, detention, uh, taking children away, racism, or at least the racist effect. Mm. You know, I mean, it, it might be bureaucratically neutral, but the effect certainly it was going to affect correlation. Uh, my, we're going to go back and speak to uh, Sarah, who's there as well, um, another excellent figure. But to talk more about how it affects certain communities in different ways, so migrant women and undocumented people and working class, you know, the system has all sorts of ways of isolating you and treating you in, in a different way, sp specifically when you're low income. Yeah, there's a lot there. Um, so on a slightly well. A similar topic, earlier on today I was talking to Frances Coppola. Yeah. Um, so she tweets a lot, know, <laughs> knows her stuff, used to work in... Formidable. Yeah, she used to work for the banks. A, I think she was a NatWest RBS. She did the IT transformation. But um, she's writing a book about helicopter money, which doesn't sound very f easy to understand or follow. Mm. Uh, she explained what it was to me earlier on today. So you've got basic income, QE, so QE is understood as when um, it's monetary policy, as in it's when central banks print money um, and then afterwards use it to buy bonds. Right. Um, also known as fixed income, by the way, as in not, not shares. But um, helicopter money, she, I think she explained to me that that is when the government give money to people and as opposed to, to the bond market. Right. Buying the government's bonds. So at least it's getting closer to the right place. Mm -hmm. And what she was saying about the difference between helicopter money and basic income is that basic income is a right. It's understood to be, it's your right. You, you deserve it. Whereas helicopter money is at the government's discretion. And helicopter money is more to save the economy. Right. So, to save so is the, there an example of that that maybe currently exists? I think they do it in Japan. I think right. they've done it okay. in Japan. So it's almost like a to voucher. Save the economy, right. Yeah, it's almost like a voucher that you give people to buy. And she was also saying um, that she thinks helicopter money should be used as fiscal policy and not monetary policy. So not as where you print money, um, but more as part of the tax system. So there you are. <laughs> um, she's writing a book about it. We're going to get her on the show. Uh, well, not this show, but we're going to video her soon. Excellent. Um, so that's she had a specific uh, central thing that she wanted to say about what to do, how to pay for the basic income, didn't she? Mm, can't remember. Getting rid of the DUP, DWP. D I've done it. <laughs> yeah, I said that to you on the phone earlier yeah, today, didn't I? Oh, yeah. DUP and DWP are very different things. Um. <laughs> okay, yeah, she did say, oh no, yeah, good point. So what she told me was the reason why she thinks one should get rid of the, the, D the DWP is because the DWP focuses on families 
and not individuals. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, okay, that's interesting. And she basically said, and therefore, like Chris Hughes said, the research has shown, when you focus on families, that will keep women in domestic violence situations, in dangerous situations. Whereas yeah. if it goes to the individual, then that's it. You can't have uncertainty or confusion about mm. where the money's supposed to go. I mean, I would totally agree with the idea of the destruction of the DWP, having seen how badly... Um, it's all bureaucracy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it's created more surveillance. And this is something I said at LSE, was that we've had so many welfare policies happening in the last few years, um, and all were meant to help the low income and to incentivize them. Yet every single one of them has taken more resources away or has stopped short of giving them more resources and made the whole process either more humiliating or, you know, more um, difficult for people to actually get through the process and get the resources that they need. So the idea of, you know, what Chris Hughes was saying about a cash transfer, we do have an entire policy system that, that works to not actually give people resources. Yeah. I remember when I interviewed David Graeber last year, he said that um, he was reviving his work in uh, Bullshit Jobs. Mm. And he's got a new book out called Bullshit Jobs. I don't know when it comes out. But he was saying all of these people who are unnecessarily suffering by going to the job centre every couple of weeks mm. and they're never going to get a job and all of this kind of stuff and how unnecessary, how cruel and unnecessary it all is. Uh, we noticed an article a few weeks ago where he was quoted <laughs> And this was written by a woman who was working for the Monocle. Yeah, um, interning. Interning for the Monocle magazine and getting paid 20 or £30 pounds a day on for, for lunch and travel and having to show yeah. her expenses. So she wrote a great article. It was on the front page of the Monocle. And then afterwards, she wrote an article for The Guardian saying that she's suing them for unpaid wages. In her excellent article, she said, she quoted Graeber as saying, in America, if you're poor and you have a child you know that maybe there is a small chance that maybe your child will make it somehow in business. Mm. And then he said, but you also know that they will never become the arts and culture critic of the New York Times. Now, I Very thought good. that was, yeah, I thought that was great that he was able to say that because it showed you those kinds of closed doors. And it brings me smoothly onto my next topic, <laughs> which is that yesterday I went to see a play by James Graham, mm -hmm. a very successful playwright called The Quiz, about the major who won a million pounds on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire in 2001, I think, um, by using various cunning strategies, including people coughing at the right answer and things like that. It was very good. Um, and it just so happens that James Graham is also involved in an initiative to get more working class actors and directors into the theatre because I assume of what David Graeber has talked about, which mm. is, it's, I mean, what's going on? There's a type of apartheid going on. Absolutely. You know, and, and, in the arts, I mean, I think people can probably see it on their own um, TV screens, <laughs> um, especially when we have like the things like Downton Abbey and stuff like that was a whole kind of genre of things that were being pushed in people's faces. There was a Lenny Henry speech a little while ago that said for um, over the last few years, for every one uh, BAME person who has left the creative industry. Sorry, to... what's, what's BAME? I really don't like this. Term. <laughs> I know, I don't, I mean, what is, yeah. What is, yeah, anyway, yeah. Black and minority ethnic. Um, and for every one person that's left the industry, two white people have joined. Uh, right. in recent years so that's the, the makeup of it but also in terms of you talking about in jobs and yeah like yeah you can see. In, right but i mean i did some work around i worked with a friend of mine who's a working class theater director and i did a bit of stuff with some writing and attachment stuff at the time so i was a little bit had a little foot in uh, seeing what the theater world was like and her experiences as a working class girl who's now, uh, you know, award-winning director, but also still understanding how this entire creative industry works and uses these people. Um, I won't say who it was, but I was talking to one person who was a director of a famous kind of venue who said that as soon as they did a, a play that was hardly political at all, but was slightly saying something about education, um, some of the donors were, were starting to cool off. So instantly you have a, 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 an industry that's also reliant on these rich donors who don't 
who control, essentially, in a similar way to the media, I guess, what goes out. Um, because they won't like it if you say something that's not, um, you know, I guess, what are the tropes of, of some of these theater things that they have, like the Slumdog Millionaire triumph stories. and So, for, you know, so forget, yeah, okay, so, so we're not even talking specifically about race here at all. We're talking about class, and it's about sanitization, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I mean, at the same time, I'm sure that I've seen things, they, they might not have been that big, that were blatantly about class and things like that, but they, yeah, that's it. They were about class, and they may have been written by people who, like James Graham, sure. Or I remember seeing Beth Steele's play, which was just absolutely wonderful. And these are both, I mean, yeah, I've not spent much time with them, but they're working class and they say so. But you still get the impression, not so much with their work, which is very clever and very good, that the theatre is still, um, you know, as as Graeber described it. Yeah, yeah. There, it creates all sorts of, I mean, we were talking about this, these industries create all sorts of ways to further exclude you. So we already have, you know, the UK's, the government's own report said that UK is so elitist, it could be social engineering. But then in these creative industries, you then create these internship levels whereby you can only do them if you have enough money to survive. So there's another layer of being unable to enter those things. Right. Well, the play was very good. Mm-hmm. Um, I am so sure uh, that the major is based on Ian Duncan Smith. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, that's just my idea. I mean, it may not be true at all (sighs) because it's from 2001 and I remember around then after Ian Duncan Smith became the leader of the Conservative Party and private, I used to call him Ian Coff Duncan Smith. And (laughs) it it did feel as though it was quite similar to the whole Brexit debate because of the way that you can have someone who doesn't know the answers but somebody creates systems Mm. for them He's but, got, I've got such a, I mean, yeah, oh God. Yeah, but I mean, it was a really, really good play. Yeah, and yeah. I, and I, I really, would like, I would, it sounds pretty interesting. Yeah, I really recommend it. And also just um, just James Graham's work. I've seen his other plays and um, yeah, they're fantastic. The CMA, Competitions and Markets Authority. Yes. Any news on that? Well, they've um, appointed someone who was previously head of the, Treasury Select Committee, is that right? Andrew Tyree. That's right. Okay. Um, people seem to think that he was good at the Treasury Select Committee. <laughs> Not sure how I would have run it. If he I... still got lied to and there wasn't much that came out of it, was there? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't really want to go too far sure. into all of that. But, um, yeah, just um, the word controlled opposition comes to mind. <laughs> but, yeah, so he's now in charge of the competitions, Competition and Markets Authority. And it looks like the first thing that they happen to be doing is launching a probe into the Daily Mirror purchase of the Daily Express, which is quite interesting, you know, going from finance to media and competition. I mean, how famous are they for actually ever doing anything, the Competition Marks Authority? <laughs> I'm got, not sure. I think Ian Fraser spoke to us and said they've basically got no teeth and, you know, okay, they don't seem to have any power. What, they haven't exercised any kind of power whatsoever on any of the big decisions of the last few years. Although I'm just wondering who is it that's... Um, because with... So Disney are buying... Sky oh God, yeah. and Fox are sort of divesting themselves of this stuff. And I think they, somebody said, it might have been, I don't know if it was the Competition and Markets Authority, someone in the UK has said that Disney have to buy the whole thing. Mm. So I'm not sure if they're turning it into a domino where they're saying Fox have to buy the rest of Sky. And then once Fox have bought the rest of Sky, then Disney can buy Fox and have the whole of Sky. Yeah, I but, think it's but, something like But that. Disney have to buy the whole of Sky. And now they're saying that Comcast, an American company, might buy that fraction, blah, blah, blah. I mean, not sure. But again, all these kinds of wrangling over justice, competition, what's fair, what's best for business and mm. all this stuff. And in the end, you just kind of feel a bit excluded mm. from just the meaning of it all. Yeah. I think it's interesting because who is it who's been bringing up? I think Matt Hancock has said recently that... Matt Hancock, who's he? uh, He's media... What is it? What's the name of the department? Media Media Culture, that's it. Media, Culture and Sport. So he's come out and said, oh, you know, we will, for the first time I've heard the word, might, we will regulate Facebook um, if they don't, you know, do more to, to protect privacy. And what we've had from this government is constantly from Amber Rudd, from Theresa May, this this want to clamp down on social media. Now, that could be to do with the fact that, obviously, these platforms have created a place where different points of view can exist. Um, so he wants to clamp down on... On um, Facebook, which is like... So in our heads, right, in my head, that's a... In a regulating Facebook is a good thing. But... 
you see the same government having no problem whatsoever with uh, a tightly owned media system that existed before, but now they do have a problem with social media. So they, so they, 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 they won't take anything against the press as it exists. They'll be like, we need a free press, need a free press, need them to do what they want. But now we have a problem with these social media companies that they always <laughs> seem to be coming after. Okay, well, on the subject of contradictions that you've clocked, what about the um, bus passes? Oh, God. Come on, Cam, you know this turf better than me. Oh, Come on. Dear. What happened? So we had uh, Jeremy Corbyn coming out and saying, under 25s, free bus pass. Right. So sounds, sounds like a good idea, right? Young mm. people don't have much have much less money than before in terms of their jobs and you know, okay. insecure work. So I was listening to the Spectator podcast. Um, <laughs> Owned by Andrew Neil. Owned by Andrew Neil, yes, our boy. Um, and Fraser Nelson was on there saying, Oh, you know, I think it's um, bribing any age group is such a waste of taxpayers' money. Obviously, bearing in mind that the government has been bribing old people for a long time. But he then he did say that the over 65s bus pass was a bad thing because it allowed millionaires to go from city to city for nothing. I mean, it's not I don't a train know. Pass, is it? I don't know what to. Yeah, I don't know where to start with this because. First of all, the idea that um, our buses are full of millionaires who are getting away with it. Old millionaires. Uh, <laughs> old millionaires, OAP millionaires who are getting away with it. Or second of all, that it's bad that rich people would use public transport rather than hideous, huge vehicles that, um, you know, contribute far, far more to well, you can, you, problems yeah. of air pollution. Well, you can... The people who want to separate themselves from the rest of society are definitely the most powerful and the, and the richest. They're the ones who have a problem with going on our public transport, yeah. not not ordinary people. All right. I mean, so I can see how he, I can see what he was doing by doing that. Mm. He's basically saying, uh, I want to attack one thing and then I'm drawing a graph and mm-hmm. I'm looking at the opposite in order to say, hey, I'm not a hypocrite because now I'm going to attack yeah. the rich. And as you said, he's attacking the rich in a place where they're not going to suffer. From you know you can you can say <laughs> he can say yeah we've got to stop them doing this and we've got to stop them doing that yeah yeah and, yeah and the people that he's stopping on this particular it's an imaginary demographic exactly the idea that um, the very richest are, are are cashing in on the perks of an over sixty five bus pass or an under twenty five bus pass because the taxpayers alliance has come out this week well one woman from the organisation has said so so minimum wage twenty five year olds have to pay for the 24-year-old banker to use the buses. I mean, these demographics, I've never seen them talk before. What we are concerned about um, millionaires getting away with has been corporate tax cuts for millionaires. Those are the places that we're that they're cashing in on. They're not cashing in on the uh, free bus pass, which is just, just such a bizarre conversation. Yeah, sure. I'm just looking through the paper here at the moment <laughs> to try and find um, an article that I'm quite angry about. Okay, you go right ahead. Um... um where is it? It's um, it was IA again. Who? Been, Who? The Institute of Economic Affairs. Oh my God! Kate Andrews has been everywhere. Uh, if I, it, sorry, everyone. It sounds like I'm just. Uh, <laughs> just well, made. yeah, she was um, Kate Andrews from the IEA. Gosh, I've seen a lot of her this week. Uh, someone had. Um, I can't remember the, the number, but she's been on TV and. Uh, Oh, here we go. Lots of right, places at lots and lots of times. Of yeah, late. sure. They just wheel them out, and she's so. Yeah. I mean, the American woman she just comes out and just goes blah blah blah. And she was saying, um, "Okay, no, go ahead. You you do this story first. <laughs> okay, so this is Narissa Chesterfield. I do follow her on Twitter because she is in charge of comms for um, the IEA, Institute of Economic Affairs, right wing neoliberal deregulatory think tank that wants to get rid of the NHS mm-hmm. and create an American style university system. It says here headline." This is in City AM, page 17 today, Friday 13th of April. Trade, not aid, is the best way for Britain to alleviate global poverty. Now, when I look at Narissa Chesterfield, she doesn't seem to me, off the bat, to be someone who cares about global poverty. Mm -hmm. But then again, that doesn't... (laughs) I mean, when I say that, I'm talking about her name, her tweets... (laughs) Her organisation that she belongs to and that kind of thing. You know, this isn't me saying that because she's a white blonde woman that she doesn't care about global poverty. I'm not saying that. But... It's so funny because I I had a quick scan of this Mm. and she's basically saying uh, we're giving too much money away in foreign aid. Now, this is something that so quickly gets – so uh, this is me doing debunk. Mm -hmm. So this is an argument that so quickly gets captured into this polarisation of I support this football team and you support that football team. But in actual fact, 
I remember once doing this illicit finance course, like journalism course, and they basically made it really clear that foreign aid is a bribe for large corporations Absolutely. to be able to penetrate for, you know, developing markets. Yes. And of course, she doesn't mention that. No. Nope. You know, and I'm not saying that foreign aid is good or bad. I'm saying that's what it's used for. You know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be working out ways in this current fucked up system to be able to, you know, reverse or change flows or even just help anyone out a bit. But it is a bribe. Yes. And I mean, it's generally a bribe. And there's always something that comes back in return. And around the same time as the visit happens and the deal is done, you can see something is going on in the other direction. Mm -hmm. A big deal is happening for a big company. What they, we mentioned the public-private partnerships last week, our foreign office is currently promoting these um, arrangements, wanting to use aid to promote these arrangements. Who are our government working for? Are they working for these corporations who are going to benefit? Because how is that going to help us or developing countries set up healthcare systems? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. That never, that's never, ever mentioned. That framing has never put on it. And it was recently that I think Jacob Rees-Mogg handed in a petition from the Daily Express about... Um, foreign aid. Foreign aid. Yeah, oh, God, yeah, my favourite topic. So fascism in the UK and the normalisation of it, this is um, happening. I mean, I feel slightly bad because I did vote for Brexit. Our sound engineer ripped me for it. And uh, <laughs> Tails, sorry about that. Um, and, um, yeah, obviously I'm not super proud of it. I mean, I still know why I did it, but... Um, yeah, it's a tough... It's Yeah, it's a tough one. I, think that, I don't think um, we should forget how badly the Remain campaign... Uh, run its campaign. I mean, I can't really even remember what their top line demand or... Is it possible to be a racist Remainer? I mean, obviously, it's all over anyway. And, and, and hey, if you are a racist Remainer, I'm not saying I've got massively anything against you. You know, mm. I just don't agree with you. Well, no, no, I think, it's, I think it's quite well known that um, not all racists voted for Brexit. No, no, no. What, how does it go? Not everyone who voted for Brexit was a racist, but all racists voted for Brexit. Right. Yeah, I don't think that's true at all. <laughs> I don't think that's true at all. But there you go. Um, what else has been going on? Oh yeah, that's it. I saw this article in Money Week, which I showed you earlier on. They had two. They had two articles. One was about um, family offices, mm -hmm. which uh, showed me that's kind of private wealth management, and that showed me what you were talking about, which is unearned income. Yeah. And so yeah, this morning I was watching business American Business Channel CNBC, and they were talking about fixed income markets and how they're going to be dealing with all of the uncertainty about the war in Syria and also, yeah, the other thing they were talking about, which we mentioned last week, which is that today and next week, the banks are reporting their profits in America. And so the stock market is going to go up, 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 mm -hmm. which means that it's masking two things. One, the trade war. It's as if right now no one's talking about the, chi the, the trade war with China, but only two or three days ago, there were 100 products two days in a row, yeah. another hundred products, soya, all these other things that they were going to do a trade war over. But now everyone's saying um, the earnings are being reported and they're going to be big. And they're just saying this openly. Tesco's, they reported their earnings. This was weird. On Monday, they said Tesco's are going to report their earnings on Wednesday and it's going to be big. And then on Wednesday, I was switch the TV on and they go, Tesco's are making loads of money. Part of me is thinking, if they're saying this on Monday, isn't this isn't isn't that inside information? Isn't that leaking? Like what's going on? But either way, the they were talking about fixed income, and it made me think: fixed income, basic income, um, and the way in which these different the psychologies of these people. If you're a bond trader and you're trading fixed income, you need the economy to be run in a certain way, and you don't want there to be any kind of a change. So you're against inflation because you want your money to always be worth what it is. Mm. And then you've got this whole basic income, which is a completely different psychology, which is about dignity for everybody and everybody's rights. And I'm quite sure that the basic income and the fixed income people have a completely different mentality. Yeah. And that was really borne out in that magazine article about family offices. And it was basically saying that if you're very rich, that there's a certain way that you can invest using family offices. And really the book that we covered in Heretical Finance Book Club, mm -hmm. which is first Monday of the month at Goldsmith's Political Economy Research Centre, run by Claire Bourne and John Montgomery. It was a book that we did last summer that was called Capital Without Borders by mm. Brooke Harrington. And that was all about the family office. Yeah. About Amazing trusts. Book. Yeah, about trusts 
Um, and the companies, this is funny, the name of the organization that sort of regulates uh, the trust management industry is called STEP. And I think it's the Soci Society for Trust and Estate Practitioners. Yeah. And if you get into lots of debt in this country, you have to talk to STEPs, which are taking steps to get out of debt. <laughs> Which is quite funny. But that's Capital Without Borders and that's all about the family office. Mm. And yeah, it was just talking about how you can invest in family offices and really it's just tax avoidance. Yeah, well she's talked lots and lots about the, the effect of all this income that there is in the world that is being sheltered versus, and that has much more of an effect than the money that's kind of being earned daily because you've got uh, big companies that are able to hoard loads of things. So even, even if like Apple is making a million pounds a day, in a state or whatever, the, the ability of them to hoard the amount of money that they've got, that's what's contributed to making them the most well-resourced company, one of the most, most well-resourced uh, companies, not country, but bigger mm, than a country, bigger, yeah. uh, on earth. So we think about money in the earning earn terms, right? I mean, Chris Hughes was saying, oh, you know, I go to um, people who find the whole idea of basic income weird because they're like, this isn't how money works. I haven't done anything for it. But the point is, for everybody else, uh, for the middle classes and for upper classes, they have ways of, of, of creating money from nothing and all these abilities to uh, manipulate how their money works and also to store it. And that ha there's none of those options for low-income people. It's surgical precision that they're able to do this. I think it's a very good point that you made last week and this week and at the talk. And I think one of the things that follows on from that, or at least in my mind, is the fact that Frances Coppola is doing helicopter money as the subject. She told me that her editorial, um, the editors at Polity Press, they said, uh, we want you to do helicopter money. Someone else is going to do basic income. And I realised that they've got these different worlds so technically they're these different topics, but they overlap. Mm. So helicopter money overlaps with basic income. And then what we did this month at ba um, Heretical Finance Book Club was donut economics, which brings in the ecology angle as well and debunks the difference between infinite growth and classical economics, which says right. that there is such a thing as scarcity and you can't have everything. You know, why are we doing infinite growth when at the same time we're being told... Finite you, resources. You know, yeah, exactly. So donut economics is dealing with that. And I think it's quite important, your point about how people think about money um, is so important and you need to have all of these things going on. So you need very simple education processes whereby, or debate processes where people could actually have their stance on one particular issue. Because at the moment, what happens with so many topics is you have any issue and everyone lines up on this side or that side mm. and the side that they line up on is dependent on an emotional issue much more or some kind of a strange economic tribal loyalty yeah. than it is about the actual issue itself and that That's, happens on you're so right, many things. You're right. It doesn't give any more clarity to people about how that actual system works. You're right, but framing it in that way definitely, definitely does that. Yeah, I was kind of reminded of that because this week also I'm doing a couple of courses uh, at the City Lit College in London and one of them's on reasoning and uncertainty and the other one's on um, hate no, who is it? Girdle, sort of like advanced. It's about incompleteness uh, and it's mathematical, but it's about what you cannot know. It's a, it's a philosophy thing. Mm. But um, when we did a course before on calculus, it was on infinitesimals. And one of the things that a book about it said was the Catholic Church, the, um, the Jesuits, uh, people ask this question, what happens if I take a number and I divide it by two? and I divide it by two, and I divide it by two, and I carry on. And the church said, you're not allowed to ask that question. <laughs> and it was, it was really everybody, you know, everybody lined up on one side or the other. Right. Because if you ask that question, you're a heretic. You are essentially questioning the entire power structure of your society. And so the likes of Hervé Falciani, you know, Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, all of these different people in the information war uh, the positions that they're taking is that you should have, in the same way that the stock market people, uh, your, um, what was that guy called? Robert Rubin, who used to work for Bill Clinton. He organized the liberalization of money rules around the world so mm. that in Asia, American money could come in and out easily. Globalization. Sure. And in the same way that that free flow of money 
was permitted and encouraged called globalization, in a way we could also have the free flow of information, but we don't. There are barriers there, mm-hmm. you know, and obviously there are barriers to trade and everything like that. And all these trade barriers are coming up. So people, money, information, do we have free flow or do we have barriers? And if we do have barriers, let's let's state that for what it is and look at them. Once I remember seeing this guy called Walden Bellow from the Philippines, and he said, everyone talks about globalization and free markets. And he said, all I see is protectionism. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm from the Philippines. We can't sell anything, you know, wow. or whatever. So I think when it comes to the information flow, it's quite interesting to think about it from those. That is interesting. Yeah. Well, I think we've run out of time now. So thanks for listening. See you next time. Bye.